impacts. Um, we'll talk a bit about what we will cover. Plug in America is staying busy during the, uh, the COVID pandemic. We are still keeping events going, uh, education, outreach. We're doing some policy work. Uh, we're developing materials. We are staying engaged and we really hope to see EVs be a big part of the economic recovery coming out of this. Uh, as people go back to the workplaces, we want to see workplace charging. As they uh, get back to moving around, we want to see EVs be a part of that. So we're looking forward to talk uh, with all of you, our supporters, our colleagues, our friends and other NGOs. Um, and we hope this webinar is informative <clears throat> to discuss what are some of the impacts of batteries, what is being done, uh, and what more can we do. So I'm Peter O'Connor. I do uh, policy work in the Northeast for Plug in America. I'm based in the Boston area. Um, I have in the past gone all over uh, the Northeast for Plug in America. These days I work remotely as we all do, or most of us do. Um, our speakers today, Ron Freund and Jennifer Krill are on the board of directors for Plug in America and they are experts in their own fields. Uh, Jennifer is the executive director of Earthworks, which she can talk a bit about. And Ron has been driving EV longer than anybody I know of. He's on his 23rd year of EV driving. And Hanjiro Ambrose uh, was at the Union of Concerned Scientists and is with UC Davis. And he will talk um, about some of his research. So first we'll have Ron talk about what can you as an EV driver do? I'll actually, let me grab this poll here. I'm gonna launch this poll about EVs. Um, I want to make sure I allow the panelists to vote. How long have you been driving an EV? So, like to know of our attendees, uh, how many of you have EVs and been driving them? How long have you had an EV? I myself got an EV just after November 2016, decided I should do something um, to advance sustainability, and I got an EV to help drive that learning curve. And so that means it's just about um, almost four years for me now. And then Ron, as I said, is in 23 years. So we don't have a category for him. Many of you do not yet have these EVs, but are interested in learning about them. That's great. Uh, Plug in America, we have lots of information. We hope to answer your questions uh, as much as we can. And some of you don't drive any vehicle at all, which I will say I had two EVs and we just gave one away because we weren't, um, question here. I assume a hybrid electric vehicle is an EV in your question. Now this, in this context, we mean uh, EVs and plug-in hybrids would also qualify. Um, uh, yes, we just loaned our, our leaf to a friend uh, to drive because we no longer are in need of two cars in our household. I don't have any road trips to work. Um, all right, so we have this poll. I'll keep it open for a couple more minutes and then I'll show the results. And so Ron will talk about what you as an EV driver, if you are one, can do to help your battery last longer and thereby reduce some impacts needed for manufacturing batteries. Jennifer will talk about some of the mining impacts of batteries and the different initiatives to mitigate those. And Hunter will talk about a range of his research, including uh, manufacturing impacts, energy impacts of manufacturing and recycling initiatives. And he'll touch on some of his research um, from UCS and from UC Davis. All right, we are at 92% have voted. I will show the, uh, the polling now. So that's where we are. So a fair amount of people have been driving EVs for more than 10 years or seven to nine years. Uh, the most common is three years or less. A lot of new EV adoptees, that's great. And about a quarter of you don't yet have EVs, we hope that we can help you change that in the future. Um, okay. All right, so now I'm going to go on mute and, oh. And go on mute and uh, hand this over to Ron for his talk. Ron, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, I'll share my screen. I just did, go ahead with the screen. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. 
This is Ron Freund, and uh, I'm just going to talk to you about things that will help you maximize your uh, life of your battery. I have uh, had the unfortunate uh, circumstances of uh, swapping out uh, a lead acid battery pack uh, with great difficulty long ago. Um, and I now have a, a 2002 uh, Toyota RAV4 with 125,000 miles on it. Uh, also very near the end of life. My range is down. I can still go, but not as fast. Uh, I, you know, it just takes real long to accelerate. You drive like an old man. Anyways, uh, go ahead with the first plot slide and let's launch into this, Pete. Okay, uh, these are real general recommendations. Uh, I'm pleased to see that a lot of uh, the drivers have uh, a couple of years under their, uh, their belts. Uh, keeping tires uh, at recommended pressures is really a, a no-brainer. It's, uh, it's free to do, but uh, the penalties of not doing it uh, is reduced range and waste of energy. So get yourself a good gauge, uh, not a stick gauge, uh, something with a round gauge. Learn to use it so it doesn't sit there and go as you're pressing it on the uh, valve stem on your tires and do it regularly, do it monthly. Cause uh, just like a balloon, a party balloon, after a while uh, the air permeates out of the, uh, uh, the membrane and uh, you know, even a big fat tire loses air over time. It's not a perfect uh, container. Another good uh, tip is just uh, pad your estimates when you make uh, a long distance trip. Uh, local trips, I assume you will be charging as needed uh, locally, wherever you get your charge from. But um, when you take a long trip, add a little extra for conditions. Uh, that's, it's real important. We'll talk about the conditions, the seasonal conditions, et cetera, shortly here. And uh, there's a good uh, trip planner software you can find, abetterroutplanner.com. Uh, I just put the, an abbreviated link in there. Uh, you can set that up for whatever EV you have, and they have a good variety in there. It's based out of Europe. Uh, they have a paid version of it, which gives you a couple extra little options. But it's a good piece of software to use, and you can make a lot of changes. It does take a little learning. Go ahead, Pete. Next slide. Okay, state of charge. Let's consider this a glass of water. Full charge, 100%. Empty is 1%. There's also the state of discharge, which is uh, one minus that. In any case, uh, here's the biggest suggestion. Use uh, state of charge windows when you're charging your battery. Uh, I like to use 90 percent full and I rarely go below 10 percent discharge and you know 10 percent left. Uh, you may want to, your mileage may vary, you may want to go 80-20, 90-15, 95-5, whatever. The bottom line is stay away from the extremes. Fully charged unless you're going on a long trip you're immediate, immediately leaving and fully discharged. And the worst behavior is jumping on it when you're near full discharge. That'll really hurt things because you're on a discharge curve which has a very sharp knee in it. And uh, you, you don't wanna be uh, straining things when you're at the very ragged end. There's a couple of behaviors to avoid. Uh, filling the thing all the way to the top, sitting in, in heat waiting to come out three, four hours can do long-term damage. Not perceptibly, but in the long run, it'll show up. Uh, cause and effect are not immediately obvious, but there's many variables that are involved in uh, you know, gauging battery life. Another bad one is do a deep discharge and abandon the car for three, four days. Uh, and you've got to be aware of your vampire loads. These are constant loads that the car has. Um, my car tends to turn itself on in this incredible heat wave we have here in the West right now. It turns itself on and tries to cool itself multiple times during the day. And I'm surprised when I'm seeing normal overnight discharges, maybe four or five miles lost. But uh, when it's 10 and 12 and more, I'm going, whoa, maybe I better park someplace else. Okay, next slide, please. Opportunity charging. I just mean whenever you can find, if you're going to your sister's house and uh, you know she has an outlet available, plug in, get a boost. It doesn't have to be entirely filled. This is behavior that your battery you know, will benefit from. You don't need to go all the way to the top. Like I used to hate to go to the gas station. I would fill it up all the way to the top, two clicks, and then I'd go home and I'd drive and drive and drive and drive and drive and drive until it was very near the end. I'd do it again. I just didn't do other friends of mine that they'll go to the gas station multiple times a week and put two or five dollars in or whatever. It doesn't buy you much nowadays. But uh, that's just a waste of time. I, don't, I, I, I can't do that. So whenever there's a possibility, fill it up as you can. Um, filling to the top is absolutely not necessary. Okay, driving habits. Try to plan with contingencies. Uh, have a plan, be ready. 
Uh, this is easy to say, but if you're going on a long trip, you may want to think about intermediate stops. Uh, my body says after a couple hours, I'm getting stiff. Uh, my wife says bio break needed. Uh, you know, we pull over every couple hours just for a couple of minutes. If it's to wash the windows or whatever, you know. Uh, so build in some contingencies. And for the various levels of charging, level one is 120 volts. Level two is 240 volts in the U.S. Fast charging is something you can find in public. And no, you can't put a fast charger in your house because it's very unusual that um, your power company will uh, give you a three-phase power in your house and that's what's needed. Um, so there's the typical limits. Level two charging at uh, you know seven to 10 kilowatts is plenty fine you know, for most people. Uh, 10, 20 miles an hour uh, overnight charging is, is real good. Now, if you live in an apartment, that's a subject for a lot of debate. Let's talk offline sometime. Uh, and if you want to learn about what the technical details are, the SAE has a reference of the J1772 uh, uh, standard that everybody's using. That's available online too. Next slide, please. Okay, when you're driving, electronics hates three things, vibration, dirt, and heat. Okay, jackrabbit starts uh, will stress the entire system. Your tires will wear out, fuses get stressed, the batteries get stressed, and uh, it's just not a good thing. Uh, in fact, engineers have transient analysis programs to make sure that their, st uh, their systems that they design can handle these uh, uh, sharp transients, and sometimes there's an upper limit. Hard throttle at a low state, state of charge will really take an unbalanced older battery pack and just drive it crazy. Uh, that's particularly bad. So don't, don't jump on it when you're at 2% state of charge left. And you know, I see a lot of people, the final uh, speed up just before they take an off ramp. Uh, why do they do that? Just coast off the off ramp, whatever. And uh, I see that behavior. Okay, energy consum consumption is proportional to speed, very important. Over 35 miles an hour, that's when aerodynamics uh, effects take, uh, take place. And the relationship between 35 mile an hour power consumption or energy consumption and 70 miles an hour energy consumption is not linear. It's not doubling, it's a quadrupling. So that square law is something that you need to take into consideration. So if you're starting to wonder, gee, are we gonna make it? Our, our state of charge is dropping real quickly, slow down. And if you're in a hurry, you probably should have planned a little better or left a little earlier. You get the idea. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, weather conditions, fighting headwinds, uh, real nasty, uh, that really uh, can uh, increase your effective uh, energy consumption because you're, you're swimming through air even faster than your ground speed, your road speed is, is telling you. Something you have to compensate for. Uh, again, pad your, um, your energy consumption estimates when you're on a long road trip. Uh, if you think you can make it with 190 miles on the indicator and you got 195 to go, you're going to have to slow down because the aerodynamic effects are just nasty. Wet weather and cold weather change the conditions. You can read the slide as well as I here. Um, just something to consider. And it, it does make a difference. Cold air is remarkably thick and it does increase your energy consumption. Okay, next slide, please. Parking. The uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning system is HVAC. Uh, that's the second biggest drain on the battery outside of the, the, the motor itself and moving the car. Lighten that load whenever possible. Some new cars, the, the uh, Model X, uh, I'm sorry, the Model Y have a heat pump in it uh, for the Tesla people. Some old Toyotas like my own had a heat pump, remarkably effective, even down to freezing temperatures. Uh, it's very complicated how they work, but uh, they do uh, save a fair amount of energy compared to just a resistive heater, which is pour energy in and let the heat pour out. The nice thing about electric heat is it's virtually instantaneous. You don't have to wait for the cooling system to get up to temperature. So using these window screens is a good idea and trying to keep your battery at moderate temperatures. Uh, an air-cooled uh, cooling system for the uh, batteries has been shown by past history, past vehicles, not as effective as liquid-based cooling and active cooling. Active cooling is like my car, uh, in these 98 degree temperature days, all by itself sitting parked in the shade will turn its air conditioning system on and cool the battery. Not the cabin, but the batteries. So air cooling is just not as effective. You don't have as good uh, uh, transfer of, of energy. Next slide, please. Okay, two seasons, summer and winter. 
the name of the game is keep your interior temperature low uh, and sunshades do that real well. It's also interesting all the plastic we have in our cars. Uh, they outgas uh, even over the entire life of, their, uh, of the car. If you heat up uh, the plastic, uh, you'll have uh, these uh, volatile organic compounds uh, uh, depositing a film on your glass and you, you'll see it when you're driving at night and why are the headlights all grizzly and they look sparkly? It's dirt on the inside of your window and it is hard to clean. Microfibers and uh, a lot of elbow grease is what's needed. Crank up your windows or crank, crank them down a little bit, just a one inch gap. Uh, not enough for uh, debris and uh, um, rain to get in, but enough for the uh, hot air to get out. Okay, next slide, please. In the winter, park in the uh, sun during the daytime hours if you can. If you're in a parking garage, try to park in a corner where the wind doesn't come whistling through because it'll cool your battery pack down. And uh, the battery pack at really low temperatures, if you've got a, a wind chill factor of minus 15 or something, that battery pack will get closed, uh, get cold and it will not perform at optimal levels. So you wanna, uh, if you have a carport at home, try to protect it with uh, some sort of other coverage. Uh, you know, maybe bushes around the outside of the carport. Sure, they take a while to grow, but you wanna keep your car out of the cold wind. Heat seats, uh, heated seats are always uh, very nice to uh, uh, <laughs> give you comfort. There's only one trouble. You can get all bundled up and wear all your gloves and stuff, but your breath, uh, it's still going to produce uh, moisture and th those vapors will condense on the inside of the window. You'll have icing on the inside of your window. So if worse comes to worse, you're going to have to run the air conditioner to uh, at least do moisture control. Uh, so the tips are try to be nice to your battery uh, for longevity. And uh, if you have a Tesla, for example, go to the dealer and ask him what the state of your battery is. If you have multiple, I saw some comments, somebody has a couple hundred thousand miles on his uh, uh uh, car already. Go to the uh, the dealer and ask them to do a check, and they'll give you a, a, a percentage of degradation. Uh, and it's it's very useful to uh, understand what's going on. So I'm pretty much done. I'll entertain questions in the Q and A or privately with email. Go for it, Peter. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we'll do some questions um, at the end. I'll do a quick one here because it is a uh, it's relevant. What does SOC stand for? That state of charge. That's the percent charge that the battery is. Uh, we'll get to some of the other ones um, afterwards. And uh, first we'll do all the speakers, then we'll do some Q&A. All right, now uh, Jennifer will talk about the minerals going into our batteries. You've probably heard from different people about, oh, I hear the mining impacts are really serious. Well, you know, they're, we still think EVs are an absolutely great solution for climate change. They do have impacts that we know about and we are aware of. Um, and we'll talk about those now. So Jennifer. Let me unmute. Okay, how does that look, Peter? Very good. Great. Okay, great. So first, uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, all for showing up today to hear about these very important issues. And Ron Freund is, um, a uh, renowned expert in um, the driver experience of electric vehicles. I first met Ron, um, in, when would that have been, Ron? 2003? Um, we were a group of people that co-founded Plug in America, and we were, at the time, before Nissan Leaf, before Tesla, we were formed um, to dedicate an organization to ending the era of the internal combustion engine. For the past decade, I've also been the executive director of Earthworks. Um, that's an organization that um, convenes environmental and human rights NGOs, along with the labor movement and unions, affected communities. Our goal is to ensure that frontline voices are at the center of the debates about climate change. Um, we educate companies about impacts, we educate uh, regulators, and we work to uh, ensure that there is an adoption of transparent mineral sourcing systems that respect the rights of affected communities. About half of our work is focused on oil and gas extraction. We work to um, stop the expansion of fracking. We work to reduce the harm for people who are um, on the front lines of the oil and gas industry. 
And the other half of our work is focused on mining and mineral impacts. We really see this clean energy transition at Earthworks as an opportunity to reduce our dependence on dirty mining as well as on dirty fossil fuels. And we think that by demanding responsibly sourced materials, that clean tech companies and drivers of electric vehicles can help accelerate our renewing renewable energy transition while pushing the mining industry towards better practices and to clean up its act. So I want to talk a little bit about what some of the impacts of mining are. And I just realized I'm going to get rid of this screen since I'm screen sharing. Make sure that looks okay for you all. Um, so metals mining is one of the most greenhouse gas intensive industries on the planet. It causes permanent harm to ecosystems. Uh, in order to mine today's in generally very low grade ores, um, companies use an incredible amount of, move an incredible amount of ore in order to extract the target metal, which leads to incredible biodiversity displacement and, and risk to water. Metals mining permanently removes water from the hydrological cycle, and it can cause permanent contamination that um, is, is known as water treatment in perpetuity. When we move so much ore and earth around in order to extract these minerals, we're exposing acid generating components in the soil, which um, it, we're, and we're talking about ore that hasn't been disturbed in geologic time scales. So water treatment in perpetuity refers to mines that when left behind will require a treatment system on site for more than 10,000 years into the future. We can't forecast further than that. So we're, we're talking about a very disruptive, um, a very disruptive industry with very severe biodiversity impacts. There are also severe human rights impacts. The community harm for mining is infamous. We hear a lot about conflict minerals. We know that um, there are concerns with forced labor, with child labor, and other human rights abuses. There have been tailings dams, dams that were designed to hold back the mine waste um, after mining occurs that break and then downstream ecosystems are flooded. The photo here is from last year in Brazil, the Brumadinho mine disaster, um, which wiped out communities downstream. Um, this is uh, an extremely uh, concerning <laughs> issue for people who were formed in order to, for, or for work that was formed in a lot of us who were involved in the EV movement in order to fight the impacts of climate change, which we know can be very devastating as well. And we support the idea uh, and, and are committed to advancing uh, an urgent transition to renewable energy, and that includes EVs. Um, we think that this transition is necessary to avert climate catastrophe. Yet, renewable energy and electric vehicle production require minerals that are dug out of the ground and that could have those same impacts that I was showing you earlier. Cobalt, nickel, lithium, and other key minerals um, are, uh, are, are essential for EV transition. And with this long track record of human rights abuses and environmental destruction, we see the opportunity to accelerate the transition to power our economies um, to use low carbon energy is a necessary and, and, and a terrific opportunity to be aggressive and ambitious in protecting human rights and the ecological well being of the communities and ecosystems that are affected by mining minerals for driving the electric vehicle transition. The challenge for us is how do we avoid? recreating some of the same environmental and social impacts for mining for coal, for drilling for oil and gas, and for building um, today's economy that is powered by fossil fuels and internal combustion engines while we pivot to this renewable energy transition. So we looked at some details about what we would need for a renewable energy transition. Um, this was research commissioned by the University of Technology, Sydney and examined um, key minerals that are um, a part of the demand for battery electric vehicles, solar, um, voltaics, uh, 
electricity generation and wind um, turbines, wind electricity generation. Um, we examined um, what, what were the most likely scenarios for rapid uptake of these um, technologies. We also looked at the cumulative demand. Um, if we achieve the most ambitious renewable energy and climate targets by 2050, what are our uh, minerals of greatest concern? And then we also examined the impacts of greatest concern. And that's what led us to focus for the time being on cobalt, lithium, and nickel. Because in part, the maximum scenario for demand compared to existing reserves um, that are available in the world are so much larger than, than what is available. So we know that for these three minerals, there's going to be a lot of new mining required. And we know that the impacts are very concerning. So, um, we also know that, that recycling and increased efficiency through the report, and you can check out the full report on our website. I'm not going to go into the super details about it, but it, uh, there's an opportunity to reduce demand if we increase recycling and efficiency, but we can't meet all of our demand. So we need to um, really tackle this problem of design and also this problem of what to do about the minerals that must be mined. So let's take a closer look at what some of these minerals might be at this nascent point in the sector's growth of electric vehicles. We're, we're really at the cusp of seeing widespread uptick of electric vehicles. So what, are, what should we be worried about and, and where can we focus our, our efforts for action? Nickel is key for electric battery cathodes. I think um, Hanjiro is gonna talk a little bit later about the specific technologies um, what we know about nickel from Earthworks perspective working on mining is that there are extreme impacts on biodiversity and human rights in the places where nickel is being sourced, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Philippines. Um, this technology of acid leaching leads to high, highly toxic, highly polluting, and also it's a very energy intensive um, process of extracting the nickel from the waste material. And then because there's a lot of proximity to waterways where these mines are sited, we've particularly been focusing on ocean, on dumping the, the practice of companies dumping mine waste from nickel mines into the ocean, destroying fisheries and, and wrecking coral reefs. Um, so these are some concerns with nickel. What are our concerns with cobalt? With, with cobalt, we go a little bit more to human rights levels of concerns. Um, the uh, uh, majority of production of cobalt comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is a very struggling nation state um, that suffered from decades of pollution as well as decades of unrest and, um, and war. Um, as a result, there's widespread uh, problems with corruption in Congo. Um, Congo is a place that's often associated with the phrase uh, uh, conflict mining. And um, there's a lot of, um, informal mining going on in cobalt. Even though it's a minority of the overall cobalt produced in Congo, artisanal cobalt mining, like uh, not companies where you can go and talk to a labor union, but an individual person going out into the countryside and digging um, up the cobalt in order to deliver it into the market. There's an opportunity for formalization of the sector, but it's gonna require tremendous work and investment of effort. Another mineral of concern, the third that we're worried about for this presentation is lithium. Most of the lithium that's in use today comes from um, the uh, an high Andean salt flats in um, the, what's called the lithium triangle, Chile, Bolivia, and Argentina. Um, the biggest worry about lithium mining right now in this region is the fragile um, desert ecosystem. It's, it, there's not a lot of water and we have deserts in California. You know how important water scarcity is and how important the, for communities that are dependent on what water sources there are that we don't um, destroy the rights of indigenous people to have access to the water in these, region, in these regions. So there are a lot of initiatives. When you have a problem with the environment, when you have a problem with human rights, and what civil society, one thing we're very good at doing is coming up with initiatives. Um, and some of those initiatives have uh, extremely limit, uh, a narrow focus on particular minerals. Some are focused on particular regions of the world. 
Um, some are driven by industry or international financial institutions, which may have faster uptake, but most likely based on past experience, weaker standards. Um, what we have been focusing on here at Earthworks with a heavy concentration on supporting communities and a heavy concentration on, on advancing EV uptake is a platform for change that helps um, advance uh, the best possible practices while uh, advocating for solutions. And so here's what we think needs to happen. We're at the beginning of a nation to industry. Let's design these products to boost recycling, to maximize recyclability, and to minimize toxicity so that we don't end up with waste stream issues um, where at the point of battery recycling, which we know lead acid batteries have a, had a tremendous um, impact with um, recycling. Um, and it took a long time for us to get that right. Let's get EVs right from the start. Let's ensure responsible mineral sourcing when new mining is absolutely necessary. Now, if we increase the amount of recycling for a number of minerals in the EV supply chain, copper, for example, aluminum, um, we, we know that there's, there's recyclable opportunities with that. But with lithium, cobalt, and nickel, we know that recyclable, recyclable opportunities are not available because there just hasn't been enough of those minerals in the marketplace because demand is going to exceed existing supply. So we need to think about how we mine those minerals responsibly without abusing human rights and without harming the environment. And then third, in a climate constrained world, we need to address consumption and transportation in a way that doesn't assume the American model of high penetration of individual vehicles, but instead um, prioritizes advancing mass transit, bike transit, how products are consumed, how goods are transported, and how investments are made in order to ensure equity and access to um, equitable transportation. Um, we know this is gonna be a challenge. And that's part of why uh, we commissioned the research so we could direct our limited resources into the supply chains where they could have the most effect. And that's also why I work both for Earthworks and Plug in America. Um, I think a lot of us on this call recognize that we, we want to begin this path towards more responsible um, transportation with also doing everything we can to have the most possible responsible sourcing. And so when I talk about responsible sourcing, I'm, I want to be extremely specific and explicit here. We're talking about um, Third party, multi, third party audited, multi-sector, multi-stakeholder governance with rigor to help make sure that we don't repeat some of the mistakes that we've seen with mining previously and with fossil fuel extraction. So Earthworks is a member, along with a number of other NGOs and labor unions, um, of the movement called the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance. I highly recommend that you check this out if you're interested in what responsible mining might look like an extremely rigorous standard at responsiblemining.net. And this is a standard for industrial scale mines. It's multi-commodity and it covers all of the issues that we might be worried about. Water pollution, tailings dam management, um, the right of workers to organize in the workplace, protecting biodiversity, no dumping of mine waste in the ocean. So, uh, and, then, and then the mines that go into Irma are independently audited by a third party evaluator against this rigorous standard. Um, so when I say responsible mining, this is what I mean. I, I mean rigorously responsible mining because having worked on climate and having worked on um, mineral sourcing for 20 years, I can tell you that without the most rigorous possible standard and oversight, we are going to have problems. And now that we're in the cusp of this nation to industry, we have an opportunity to make solutions out of the solutions that we're trying to make. So um, for more information, here's my contact info. And I also would suggest if you wanna know more about specific mining impacts, you can go to our website. Um, we've got some action alerts right now targeting a major proposed gold copper mine in Alaska, the Pebble Mine. 
and could really use your help on that weighing in against the Trump administration's excitement for this particular new mine, which would imperil the largest um, wild salmon fishery left in the world. And if you want to know more about our work and the research into mining impacts, you can also get the information there. Thank you. And I need to stop sharing my slide with you I, all. Uh, um, we're going to do most of the Q&A at the end, so let me, let me make a couple of notes here. I see people raising their hands in the uh, participant chat. What we're going to be doing for questions is doing them through the Q&A box. If you enter them there, and we'll get to those afterwards. So I see a couple of people who want to talk, and that's just going to be not feasible, I think, with as many attendees. So we'll do it through the Q&A box, and I'll select some of them to ask after everyone's done the presentations. I'll get to one question right now, though, because it really is kind of the... Um, the, the most important, I think, and it's from Blair St. Ledger Olson asking for Jennifer, do you think people shouldn't buy EVs until we address those impacts, environmental and social impacts, or can we drive electric now while advocating for change? Uh, I would say the latter. You can drive electric now while advocating for change. Those environmental and social impacts that I outlined exist with internal combustion engines as well. If you need to drive, then you're going to have to advocate for change regardless. With the, the difference between the EV industry and, um, and the traditional ICE uh, supply chain is that EV drivers are already poised to demand change and to demand uh, more responsible behavior by the companies that are supplying us with these products. Um, and the companies themselves are more equipped to demand more responsible sourcing because we are at this nation phase and a lot of design is still underway, um, we have a chance to get it right this time. So drive your EV and uh, keep an eye in this space. And whenever you have a chance to advocate for responsible sourcing, for recyclability, um, to consider mineral supply chain, to look at behavior of companies, uh, to advocate against irresponsible mining, please join us. Thank you. I also see a recurring question about um, the slides being available. The webinar is being recorded. We will send a link around afterwards and we'll discuss doing the slides, uh, sharing those as well. But the webinar is being recorded and we will have that recording available, just so you all know. All right, and I'd like to uh, hand it off to Hundro Ambrose. Hundro, can you start sharing your screen, please? Should be audio, there we go. Hello everybody, I uh, hope you can hear me, hope you can see my slides. Thank you so much uh, Plug in America for having me here today and thank you to the, uh, Jennifer and Ron for the excellent presentations, really um, covering a lot of important issues and thank you for your continued work on these, in these issues. Um, I, you know, this, these are important, important, uh, important work I think um, in trying to make this a better place. And I wanna echo some of Jennifer's thoughts before I start to, uh, I'm thinking about this on a, on a kind of a, taking a long-term perspective on aligning our, our climate change, environmental and equity goals um, with our vision of technology and infrastructure uh, development and uh, accessibility to things like low carbon energy and low carbon mobility in the future, in the future world. And, and taking that kind of higher perspective about it, you know, I'm thinking about a, the appropriate counterfactual here, right? You gotta remember there's this massive and long tra uh, tail of impact, environmental impacts from oil extraction and enabling infrastructure systems globally. Uh, and, and, and honestly, you know, the opportunities here are to craft a supply chain, a value chain of electric vehicles, which is, and I mean this when I say it's sustainable in that it is environmentally, uh, it has low environmental impacts, it is economically feasible, and it uh, is socially responsible. And so I think, you know, we should, we should remain, keep that perspective, you know, as we talk about the, the barriers and opportunities uh, in improving electric vehicles and electric vehicle uh, batteries, which are obviously the primary enabling system um, for EVs. So today, um, you know, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, promising kind of strategies for the reuse and recycling of EV batteries and talk a little bit about what that means um, for the current EV market. Um, and these are just my perspectives. As, uh, as Pete introduced, you know, I, I, was, uh, I was a fellow for the Union of Concerned Scientists and a, and a, a researcher at UC Davis. I recently um, took a position with the uh, California state government. So this is kind of the, 
last of these presentations I've been giving and, and, and sort of a, a holdover from, from that previous post, I just want to acknowledge um, that these, these views just represent my personal opinions and, and, and from as a researcher. Um, <clears throat> so uh, moving on, if I can get my slides to adjust, just thinking about the big picture, right? Uh, batteries have really crushed this cost curve down uh, more aggressively than we expected, and that is really enabling a wide array of applications. Um, you know, uh, uh, the fact that we've, we've, we're now trying to squeeze out tens of dollars in battery cost versus hundreds of dollars in battery cost, I think speaks volumes um, to where we are today as far as commercialization of lithium-ion batteries. And we're seeing now large format lithium-ion batteries in a range of transportation technologies and devices, not just light duty vehicles and personal mobility, but heavy duty vehicles, long range heavy duty vehicles, barriers that previously, you know, even four or five years ago, I think I was arguing with folks about being feasible today. You know, I, I simply show pictures of Elon Musk on stage. And I think the storyline here to some extent is that batteries are getting bigger too, and they're getting bigger out there, which means that kind of changes the implications for their life cycle, right? I mean, to some extent, the, the types of management practices um, that we've, we've used to think about consumer electronic waste start to diverge more and more as these systems become larger and larger and basically subsume the entire vehicle uh, substructure into the battery system. And as you know, Jennifer mentioned, one of the key concerns about lithium batteries are these materials, these raw material inputs, um, which are necessary to create um, the current uh, generations and current formulations of lithium ion batteries. And these kind of material constraints are nothing new to some extent, right? We've been aware of the fact that there are a subset of uh, elements which are critical to several energy, clean energy and low carbon technologies, including photovoltaic solar panels, you know, uh, so emissions control devices like catalytic converters, and obviously batteries. And I think in recognition of this, obviously the, gov the US government through the Department of Energy and Department of Interior uh, last year, um, uh, last year, um, uh, Last year, uh, enacted a critical a critical energy minerals uh, critical minerals list program to identify um, some of these uh, key elements. Um, and and we know that you know if we want to meet our electrification targets, that uh, we're going to need probably significant scale up in the current manufacturing of these raw materials, um, given the fact that you know, we'd like to see electric vehicles subsume a large part of the current vehicle market, uh, we're gonna need to see likely a two to six fold increase in some of the, produ the annual production levels of raw materials to meet that demand. And, and the, the thing here, though, is that we don't actually need to necessarily have this level of ramp up in raw material production to meet battery needs if we have successful recycling programs. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But let's talk about the short term versus the long term constraints. Because in the short term, obviously, there are opportunities for disruptions in the supply of critical energy minerals more broadly, but also for batteries. But currently, looking at existing reserves, there's, oh, there's, enough there's probably enough materials for over a billion 40 kilowatt hour batteries, which is probably about you know, half the uh, vehicle fleet, uh, given existing technologies and mineral reserves. Now, the problem with, with reserves is that they are what's called economically feasible. And so when the prices of goods change, often that means that the reserve base changes. Obviously, lithium and cobalt are some of the closest constraints as far as materials that we talk about today, but shifts, changes in the cathode composition of batteries and shifts away from cobalt may exacerbate issues with nickel uh, production. And, you know, uh, the, due to the concentration of mines globally, um, there's opportunities for further supply risks. We talk a lot of, about rare earth elements and their concentration of production in China. Um, battery uh, materials, particularly cobalt, 
where something like 60% of global reserves are actually in the uh, single region, um, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo, as well as uh, lithium, which is highly concentrated, as Jennifer alluded to, in the, uh, uh, the in South America, in Chile and Argentina, um, uh, and uh, to a lesser extent, uh, 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 nickel. Um, but uh, I think you know the complication there to some extent is that you know some places in a certain year might represent a larger share of supply with lithium in for instance um, recently you know in the last a few years Australia has been a significant producer of lithium globally even though they represent a relatively small part of the reserve base uh, and so I won't go into this anymore in too much depth but um, you know I think Jennifer really uh, uh, spoke to the the challenge that is the current supply chain for cobalt and the reliance on artisanal mining, that is mining that is conducted without large scale industrial mechanical tools. This is primarily carried out in the largest cobalt region in the world by predominantly manual labor and a lot of child labor. I mean, there's been some studies out there that says like something like, you know, 30% of the workers that, you know, might not be, might not be of age. I, I, I you know, I think, it's a, it's it's heartbreaking. Um, there's significant environmental damages, both you know, in the communities and to the workers. And obviously, it's not a sustainable um, a sustainable system. Um, and uh, uh, and that is a challenge. But um, it's not you know the the end of the it's not the the end of the story to some extent. You know, cobalt is a problem for battery manufacturers, and I think they recognize that generally. And also, it's expensive. It's one of the most expensive ingredients into the cathode synthesis, and the cathode synthesis the synthesized cathode compound is the most expensive uh, material and in, put into the battery generally, as far as what I've been told. And um, cathode materials represent a significant cost of batteries, um, you know, maybe 25% or so of the battery. And as battery costs have come down, the material cost, the relative share of material costs have increased, even as material costs have come down. Um, and, uh, and that's probably going to continue to be the case um, as the learning and, and other types of scaling factors sort of squish down the costs, um, you know, as far as overhead uh, and, and uh, capital and labor intensity of, of battery manufacturing. But what we're expecting to see widely over the next few years, and if you look at kind of what battery manufacturers are doing, we're seeing a switch away from some of the cathode chemistry. So the types of chemical compounds we're using to make the batteries today are different likely than the battery compounds that we're going to use in the future. In fact, within the next 10 years, we're expecting to see a pretty massive shift away from the kind of cobalt heavier um, types of chemistries that we've been seeing. So today in your normal, in your average consumer electronics, the majority of lithium chemistries are lithium cobalt oxide, um, which, you know, uh, has a, 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 a very high ratio of cobalt, um, twice as much cobalt, at least as some of these other cathode formulations for EVs um, as a relative, uh, 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 relative to its energy storage capacity. Now, there's also several chemistries that have no cobalt that are commercialized. Um, and, and, and China obviously does, you know, rely on iron phosphate uh, for a large part of their market. And, and there's been some attention recently to, uh, uh, you know, the million mile battery and, and Elon Musk's uh, developments in China with Tesla. And I think um, it's promising to think that we're gonna see a larger share of the market move towards the lower cobalt chemistries uh, in the near term. In the long term, well, co lithium batteries are the new kid on the block. I mean, lithium batteries, you know, the lithium cobalt oxide coin cells that we, you know, we kind of know and love for patented in the early 90s by Sony. And, um, you know, uh, lead acid batteries have been around for hundreds of years, and we only manufacture about 500 gigawatt hours of lithium, or lead acid batteries a year. Um, we're going to be starting to manufacture more lithium ion batteries than that. Um, probably in the next five years. So, so you know, I think to some extent the um, sky's the limit. There's a ton of IP, a ton of intellectual property that is in the pipeline on batteries that I expect to uh, pretty rapidly and quickly uh, evolve the uh, electro formulation around batteries, particularly to eliminate electrolyte, which is kind of the weak link in battery cells, um, as well as to uh, improve the energy, uh, improve the potential. Uh, loading of the anode um, and stability of the anode um, for those of you who like to wonk out on the battery. You know, anode stability is a big problem for lithium ion batteries. It's kind of like, you know, your sponge in your kitchen, a dry sponge, the happy sponge to some extent. These battery anodes break down over time as they soak up and uh, 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 
remove lithium. And so a more stable uh, anode with a, a stable non-organic uh, solvent electrolyte is a promising direction and also could deliver us, you know, double the energy density of today's batteries. Okay, so um, that's a, that was a, a bit of the technical stuff there, but, but, you know, just thinking kind of from, you know, as an owner perspective, here's, there's also some things you see about battery lifetime or battery chemistry improvements as an owner. And those uh, relate in part to how long batteries last and how far batteries go. Um, and so, you know, when you look at uh, uh, battery capacity and lifetime of vehicles on the road today versus even just a few years ago, you know, um, we look at the, uh, the, uh, the first Nissan Leaf that's being kind of a vintage vehicle at this point, but um, it's only eight years since the 2012 Nissan Leaf. Um, and so we're seeing that, uh, you know, batteries are, um, the battery lifetime mileage lifetime is really improved. Um, and this really changes the prospects for how we use the batteries in the vehicles, as well as how we might reuse the batteries in the vehicles. Um, so here, just a little illustration of that, you know, if you look at kind of uh, data that's out there, you know, we were seeing kind of 25% reduction in capacity of those 24 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf batteries. Um, by about 50,000 miles as early as five to seven years. And, uh, you know, we have a fair amount of, um, uh, of uh, uh, Teslas uh, on the road these days, um, and even some Chevy Bolt data that's showing some excellent, uh, well, like very low degradation. Um, anyway, a very low degradation over, over eight to 10 years, um, well within the warranty kind of, uh, or the uh, initial estimates of something like 20% loss. And uh, we're also seeing that as the battery price, as the price of new batteries has come down significantly, um, the value of repurposing the battery uh, has really increased because, um, you know, the cost to refurbish the battery doesn't necessarily uh, change a ton, but it actually does come down as batteries become, um, as the volume increases. And because, uh, you know, batteries aren't uh, going to drop likely by an order of magnitude anymore, um, there's not necessarily as much undercutting. So, you know, five, ten years ago, the best, the, the biggest competitor to a uh, used lithium-ion battery was a new lithium-ion battery. Um, because basically if you wanted to recover 10% of the cost of buying the battery, by the time it was used in its first application, it was, the new battery was, worth, was cheaper than that. And now um, that's changed as we've moved down the curve a bit. And this, you know, to sum this up a little simpler, you know, I think, you know, second life or reuse of battery capacity, because they are so much bigger, because they are going to last so much longer, um, could present a significant value to either the primary owner or to the value chain as a whole. Um, in that if we could, uh, you know, derive this residual value um, from a repurposed battery, that, that value could be passed back through, uh, theoretically at least some of it, um, to the, uh, the new battery purchase or the original owner, um, thereby lowering the upfront cost of an EV acquisition. Um, and I think that's going to be one of the most promising pathways for lowering the cost of EVs is deriving some of this residual value. Now, I want you to also think about this residual value as being a bit on a spectrum. And we talk about second life or second or repurposing as, and we, we think of that usually as taking the battery out of the vehicle at its end of life. But actually, given the fact that batteries are so going to be well oversized, meaning that, you know, you're probably going to carry a lot of extra capacity around that you don't use on a day-to-day -day basis and that um, charging systems are probably going to become more integrated. You know, vehicle-to-grid systems, vehicle-to-grid integration systems, even at managed charging or bi-directional charging, are really promising ways to utilize this residual value if, without even removing the battery from the vehicle because the battery system, when stationary, can still provide grid services, and those grid services are effectively deriving from the same residual value, which is unused capacity in your battery. Okay, um, so there's, I think there's a lot of strategies out there that we can talk about that will help you, uh, that can help EV, uh, that can help the EV community, I guess, or the EV market um, sort of uh, find ways to, to pass this value forward. Um, and, you know, it's not just me talking about Second Life. Obviously, there's a lot of talk about the potential for Second Life and has been for a while. And I think that uh, has been mostly talk. And I, I understand that there are significant barriers to that, logistic barriers uh, 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 and uh, uh, regulatory barriers um, to battery reuse, uh, as well as standard barriers, et cetera. But 
there is a real market, um, a real and a significant and growing market for uh, stationary storage, uh, both behind and in front of the meter. Um, and given that Second Life batteries could provide a really economical source of um, relatively high frequency response, uh, energy dense battery, energy dense storage, I do think that the grid, there's a lot of grid applications um, which for which um, batteries provide, used batteries even, provide an economical um, uh, storage option, uh, meaning something, you know, there's a lot of applications that can afford $100 or $150 a kilowatt hour uh, for a battery um, or, or even uh, a lot more um, and, and derive a lot of value from that. <clears throat> so uh, battery recycling, um, you know, we, we, we kind of talk about battery recycling in, in somewhat abstract terms, but it is happening today. Um, there are quite a number of commercial recycling facilities which will process lithium ion batteries from electric vehicles, although all those models currently are uh, a pay to play or tip fee model where um, someone is paying the recycler to recycle the batteries. Um, and they are relatively uh, uh, small scale. Um, in that they are in the you know 10, 10 tons or less um, kind of capacity, uh, so um, it's uh, it, it, there's a lot there's a lot to do still in recycling. And as uh, the Nobel laureates from last year um, you know pointed to, uh, the point for the long term of EVs is whether batteries can be recycled. Um, otherwise, they are not uh, truly um, a long term sustainable option for providing uh, you know low carbon mobility. And I think we can do a lot with recycling. Um, you know, I, there's more estimates, I think, coming out every day, thinking about, you know, when we can start to think about circularity um, in our material supply for battery critical minerals. Um, and circularity, by, with, by circularity, I mean the, the ability to have a recycled content um, increase such that it uh, significantly displaces, it, displaces additional primary demand. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to be very clear about that language because often we talk about recycling, we talk just about the collection part, um, or, you know, maybe we'll think a little bit about the material recovery part, but we won't often think about where those materials go and where they're cycled to in the uh, global product cycle um, and whether there actually is mechanisms or pathways for them to re-enter the same products that they were recovered from. Um, in the case of batteries, I do think there are a number of promising um, pathways uh, for managing recycled batteries. Um, I think the, the one that I, you know, has been getting a lot of discussion um, has been uh, this thing called refunctionalization or, or direct cathode recovery or direct cathode recycling. Um, the idea with this is actually that you can um, effectively using uh, physical separation means, basically grinding up a battery, shredding it and separating it with uh, air, gravity and some liquids, uh, uh, isolate the cathode compound re-lithiate it, basically recombine it with additional lithium and, and use it to remake a battery directly uh, or battery electrode directly without actually um, uh, needing to uh, refine um, the constituent elements and resynthesize the cathode compound. Um, in addition, I think there are promising, you know, uh, uh, refurbishing um, techniques and other types of testing improvements, et cetera, that I think will um, help us understand better how to recycle batteries. Um, this I'm showing you are some research that we are developing that's uh, in development. I'm, I'm actually missing a, a title on this slide, unfortunately, I apologize. Um, but uh, we've estimated uh, on a regional input output type of basis that that the U.S. could meet um, in excess of, of about 60 percent of their 2040 uh, demand for cathode materials with uh, recycled uh, uh, recovered materials um, from domestic supply. Um, and I think there's good reason to think about um, the regional uh, bins um, for uh, vehicle markets uh, and vehicle retirements and thinking about that some of those um, flows are going to continue to be regional. And there's also some you know, motivation for that from a national security standpoint with respect to our limited supply of some of the raw uh, inputs for these batteries. And the recycling, the recycled batteries or disused batteries being, I think, one of the best potential supplies um, for domestic uh, critical energy minerals for batteries. 
Okay, so examples, lead acid batteries, are lead acid a good example? I don't, I don't, I, I show this slide a bit. I, I, I don't know um, if a lead acid batteries are a great example. I think they are and they aren't. Um, you know, we have, we do see relatively high collection rates of lead acid batteries, and we report in developed countries like, you know, the United States that we have 99% or something of lead acid batteries get recycled, um, and that's, that's good. Um, but those rates aren't as good everywhere. And, you know, in places like, uh, you know, in, in Asia, uh, you know, 65 to 85% rates are more, more common in some places. And, and often recycling is not well documented. And even when it is well documented, um, you know, we have actually a legacy of environmental pollution and challenges from lead acid battery manufacturing. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, you can, you can Google Exide. Um, batteries, but but it's a uh, uh, it, it's a challenge uh, developing responsible industrial recycling systems. But it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means that we do need strong rails. And I think Jennifer alluded to this earlier was the fact that we do need strong regulations and policies in place to ensure that responsible practices and 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 and, and procedures are met and followed. And so I think um, you know uh, lead acid battery is maybe a great example of a place we can learn from as we embark on developing policies um, to support responsible end of life management of batteries. And we should also think about the challenges that we are currently posed, that are currently posed by global value chains of, for e-waste, um, which, uh, uh, you know, I think we want to avoid. Um, and we want to think about how the equity implications of global value chains of e-wastes uh, uh, you know, that our solutions for EVs might actually help us attack some of these problems as well. I think that's actually an opportunity here, is actually to do good outside of just making EV batteries even better, um, which they are getting so much better so quickly. It's kind of remarkable. Um, so key points, uh, you know, we're going to see a bunch of batteries get retired in the next couple of years because the first couple models of EVs, the early ones, you know, batteries aren't going to be quite as long lasting. Some of them are, maybe it's less reliable. Either way, we're going to see a lot of retirements as they say, as the market is ramped up. So we're going to need to think about what we do with all these batteries, you know, relatively soon. Um, and I think there are some key barriers which are well identified and are not new, you know, like this is the same story, logistics, infrastructure, knowledge sharing. It's kind of similar barriers, I think, on the material sourcing side. You know, it's very difficult to get the right information to flow up the value chain to make sure that the standards are met and that the right uh, choices are made, et cetera. And it's the same thing down the value chain. And so I think, um, you know, we're gonna need ways to share information regarding the battery system. And that might be as little as labeling and as much as, you know, data standards, uh, clearinghouse, um, OBD. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the uh, World Economic Forum's uh, uh, Global uh, Battery uh, uh, Passport Initiative. Um, which I think is a, a good step in that direction towards or towards bearing, breaking down some of these bound barriers. Um, mineral resources aren't likely to be a, a short-term limit and, and prices I think have mirrored that in that the prices of those commodities have continued to kind of come down from their peaks uh, two years ago. Um, but recycling is going to be critical in the long term. Don't suspect that peak oil will save us. Um, I think that is a bit of a myth. Um, the low value of recovered material is a barrier for the battery recycling, and that is going to require additional policy incentives. Um, you know, at some point in time, I think we are going to have to bake in the cost of recycling into the cost of batteries, and that is a challenge, um, and that will possibly increase the cost of batteries. But I think that there are plenty of places to reduce the cost of batteries and to ensure that electric vehicles are still the economical solution uh, as far as uh, displacing internal combustion engines. Battery reuse is super promising. There's a lot of skepticism out there on it, and I think some of that is justified. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities for Second Life, um, particularly for fleets and places that already are naturally aggregating load, um, and and as well, uh, you know, different things that uh, uh, ways that we can have more innovative strategies with V2GP, 1G. So attention is gaining on this issue of battery recycling. And I see policy developments, promising policy developments from the EU, uh, from, um, from China, obviously with their interim measures, and, and in the US. Um, I've been you know, working um, with some folks here, Jennifer, is a, a part of this. 
Um, on a uh, initiative, the California state government has a California lithium ion battery recycling group, um, which has been trying to develop some recommendations for the legislature on enacting some policy statewide on ensuring that 100% of electric vehicle batteries that are sold in the state are reused or recycled at their end of life. Um, I'm pretty uh, excited about these various developments and the attention being paid, um, having been doing the research on this for um, almost a decade now. Um, and uh, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that we're seeing some more attention um, to it and hopefully uh, that pays some dividends um, down the road. Thus concludes my presentation. Uh, I did, I have my uh, uh, email up here if anybody wants to reach out. And um, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, that was excellent. Uh, we have not a lot of time and a lot of great questions. So I'm gonna try to consolidate some of them into themes and then uh, all of you can feel free to jump in if I get something really wrong. So there are a number of questions about advanced battery technologies. Um, things that Tesla's working on, they might announce at Battery Day. I try to get them on this webinar. They're really hard to get a hold of before Battery Day and we couldn't wait forever. They kept pushing back to Battery Day. They might announce something great on, on new battery technologies that would change its impacts. Um, we hear about solid state. We hear about all kinds of things that would accept a faster charge, that wouldn't need cobalt. A lot of these things, I'm not a chemist, um, so I regard them as, I'll believe it when I see it. I don't know the ins and outs of how problem really is at scaling up to manufacturing scale. So, you know, with Tesla or the others who are promising new battery technologies, it could change this conversation. We don't know yet. There are always hiccups in making things at scale. Um, I guess my point is to say, yes, it's promising, things could change. Solid state batteries, million mile batteries, whatever else. For now, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, that's a common question we got on the Q&A in the chat. There's a question about what is EV battery lifetime? And Ron's talk pointed to ways you can extend your battery's lifetime. The lifetime depends a lot upon how you drive it and the conditions. Um, as, well as, as well as the, the technology itself. You know, well, apologies to Nissan, the early Leaf had some problems, the newer ones are, are doing much better. And then uh, Tesla and GM had a very different uh, technology style for managing the battery's temperature. Um, and that worked out quite well in terms of a longer lifetime battery. Longer batteries affect its calculations. They reduce the need for uh, replacing the batteries or, or making new ones. Um, they also impact the, the second life, which was asked about. So these kind of come together into the three R's of reduce, reuse, and recycle. By following Ron's tips, you can reduce the need for battery replacements. You can make your battery last longer. But, and then reuse is that battery second life, which we had a question about. Battery second life is using the battery, taken out of the vehicle, and using it as a grid asset. It doesn't have to take it out of the vehicle, as, as Hondro said, but generally that's what is done. BMW uses a stack of old batteries from their, I think, Mini Coopers um, to provide demand response on the California grid during times of peak demand. So that's using the batteries as, as storage for renewables or storage for peak demand times. That's battery second life. Um, that's really the reuse part. And then recycling, we've heard quite a bit about. Recycling key components of the batteries or refurbishing them entirely into new ones. So as we know from, you know, environmental process in general, that's what you want to do is reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, some of the other questions that have come up a lot. Um, advanced hey, battery. battery yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, just to say, I mean, like, I really appreciated Ron's talk on, on kind of ways you can keep your battery last and longer. You know, it's true that batteries tend to sweat when they're the top and the bottom of their capacity, um, but really they're at the top and the bottom of what we call it their, their, their voltage, right? They're at the top and the bottom of their voltage response. And basically they're sweating when they're at the top and the bottom of their range. And that accelerates exponentially these types of side reactions that occur that degrade the battery's performance. And no matter what you do, it just is basically that you result in like you can't cycle the lithium as much. And that is totally true. But at the same time, 
batteries, bigger batteries, you know, so just as Ron was saying, like, you know, you don't put your battery, don't leave your battery at 99 and try to keep it above 10. You know, what's easier to do that is when your battery is bigger because, uh, you know, when it's a bigger vehicle, honestly, more of your driving cycle is gonna fit within a smaller bracket or a smaller bin of that range. And honestly, larger batteries, as we, the battery systems are getting bigger, the, pr the primary degradation factors that are gonna govern battery life are gonna be calendar aging effects and thermo, thermo, uh, therm thermolytic reaction, but basically it's gonna be uh, ambient temperatures is what I'm trying to say, ambient temperatures. Because, um, basically it's going to be how long you're storing the battery at a temperature is one of the primary ways in which batteries are going to die. And so, uh, basically batteries are going to last a long time then, you know, they're going to last a relatively long time as long as they're, you know, um, in a, 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 nor a normal ambient environment to some extent. Um, and, uh, anyway, I just thought I would, I would put that out there because I think, um, it's, it's important to remember that your, your, uh, the, the lifetime is really improved on these. And yes, the thermal management while they're being driven is huge, but you know, I think you know, 12 to 18 years for these batteries is very reasonable. We, we, we put them in aerospace applications and we run them on 100,000 cycles um, over and we expect them to make 25 year missions. So I just like, you know, we, they, can, they can last in an EV for 12 years, it's true. So one solution that, that I'm curious about that might work, um, uh, for this is shared vehicles. Now we've heard about these three simultaneous revolutions, transportation to shared, autonomous, and electric. Plug in America focused on electric, but these other, other transitions would also impact how we do that. Shared vehicles would have um, more utilization for any given battery. So if it were a million mile battery that was getting those million miles done in, in 10 years, perhaps, uh, it seems that would reduce impacts compared to having, you know, five batteries over those 10 years for five cars, having one shared vehicle that was getting a lot of use at, you know, a zip car kind of arrangement or something like that. You know, is, would that reduce impacts going to shared autonomy more? That's not our main focus at Plug in America, but, you know. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know, and Hanjira, maybe you know if there are studies uh, about this particular issue that we can point the uh, requester to. In in principle, from a perspective of, of a campaigner, what we are striving to do is create disruption. In 2020, we're living in disruption. So there's a tremendous opportunity to change the system under which we've been currently operating. Um, you know, Plug-in America is, is an organization designed around um, passenger vehicles or advancing battery electric vehicle uptake. Um, and I think there's, you know, all, we've always been interested in, in trucks and in two-wheel, three-wheel options um, and supportive of mass transit, bike transit, shared vehicles, and other alternative transportation systems. But you're right, it's not been Plug in America's particular focus. I think if, if we're talking about a climate constrained world, um, we, and we're talking about maximizing um, uh, opportunity to achieve transportation equity while minimizing um, impacts from um, extraction, recycling, um, post-use uh, waste issues, um, then we really do need all hands on deck. So in places where vehicle sharing is, 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 sens is a sensible and accessible solution, then absolutely. It isn't a sensible and accessible solution for everybody. Um, for some people, mass transit and bike transit is a sensible and accessible solution, and so absolutely. And when we're talking at the, at the, at the planning level and the systems change level, then, then yes, we do need to, to plan for those more intensive systems change um, opportunities. One last question. Uh, we had a lot to go through. This is probably the most important one for our drivers. Does repeated DC fast charging degrade the life of an EV battery? My understanding is repeated fast charging to the top of the battery's capacity is particularly damaging, but if you stop it at 80% or whatever, then it's less of a concern. Uh, Ron, Hanjiro, Jennifer, repeated DC fast charging? I, I've been answering a lot of the uh, uh, questions in the uh, Q&A while everybody's talking. 
and I will review everybody else's slides uh, offline, but yeah, I did answer somebody asking our, uh, the DC fast charge question. It will stress the batteries. Uh, if you do hit it hard, immediately drive off to, you know, reduce the uh, accumulated heat energy uh, uh, that's built up there. Letting it sit and fully charge is not good, but yes, repeatedly fast charging, especially if you have a limited number of cells. A Tesla Model S has over 7,100 cells in it. A Model 3 and a Model Y have between three and 4,000, depending on if you have the long range or whatever. Those are thousands of cells. That's in the denominator of a fraction. Now, if you have a Nissan Leaf with 196 cells or 192 or whatever the number is, that's a much smaller denominator to divide the entire pack capacity by. As a result, each battery gets hit pretty hard. But in a Tesla, we're talking less than 1% per cell. They're barely breaking a sweat. Yawn, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it, it, it really doesn't hurt a Tesla to DC fast charge because they, just, they have so much surface area on all those cells. They distribute that heat over thousands of cells it's really not an impact. Now, other uh, batteries like the Nissan Leaf, um, they, they fell hard uh, from 2011 to 2014. Their packs were re really getting hit, especially down in Phoenix and Tucson. High temperature environments, repeated fast charging, sitting in a, uh, on, on a hot tamarack at 110 degrees um, Phoenix temperatures, that was really bad. And they were not ready for that. That's bad engineering in my book. Sorry, Nissan. But uh, yeah. Fast charging, if, you, if that's all you have a choice on, you can count on less life uh, for your entire pack because if that's all you can do if you live in an apartment on the fourth floor, sorry, that's probably the way it's going to be. Now, technology is improving. It'll get better. Go ahead, Pete. Nissan has changed its engineering on the batteries, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So they changed it. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> all right. Thank you all, this was an excellent talk. Um, the slides, uh, I think we'll make the slides available. I'll check with the, the panelists on that. We have the recording available and the q and I'll see if there's a way to save that or to continue answering these uh, now that our time is up. Thank you very much.